from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. Coming up on a special edition of Ag Day, trade deals and NAFTA renegotiations stand to be a major story in 2018. We'll look at what's ahead and speak to some of the people and businesses south of the border, most likely to be impacted by the outcome. And could a failed negotiation mean beer prices are going up? Ag Day, presented by the Chevy Silverado, high strength steel for high strength dependability. Good morning, I'm Clint Griffiths. One of the biggest unknowns for the new year is the fate of the North American Free Trade Agreement. The next round of talks start later this month in Montreal, Canada. The January 23rd to 28th meeting looms as a key moment for the future of the trilateral trade pact. Outsiders hold high expectations for major breakthroughs and there are fears President Trump may follow through on recent threats to walk away from the negotiating table and the deal. As a whole, USDA's trade forecast for the 2018 fiscal year looks pretty similar to 2017. Total ag exports are forecast to total $140 billion. Pair that with $117 billion in imports. USDA says its forecast is based on appreciation of the U.S. dollar and high demand for U.S. exports of corn and soybeans. Now, from a NAFTA perspective, in recent years, Canada has ranked as the number two consumer of U.S. agricultural goods and the top buyer of U.S. fresh fruits and vegetables. Mexico ranks number three on the overall list, but is the top destination for U.S. pork, poultry, and soybean meal. And in 2016, it ranked as the number one buyer of U.S. corn. Now, it's easy to talk about the importance of NAFTA. It's better to show you. As the invited guest of the U.S. Grains Council, I traveled to Mexico in 2017 to see how renegotiations are already altering trade. And we start just north of Corpus Christi, Texas. Grain harvest in South Texas may be over, but product is still rolling. My sorghum is just pretty much gone. There's just a few loads left. Charles Ring farms several thousand acres near Sinton, Texas. Exports have been essential to prices for decades now. I was trading corn or shipping corn sorghum into Mexico before NAFTA. And I remember having to wait until February of the following year to ship anything into Mexico because their tariff was on. Once NAFTA kicked in and fully took effect, that changed. When NAFTA came along, then all that evened out. So we could trade corn openly all year long. And it's one reason he's following renegotiations closely. You know, it can't be one-sided. And I don't think NAFTA was as far as agriculture is concerned. Now, there's other, other industries that may have been hurt. We just don't want agriculture to be the, the pawn in all of this. We want to make sure that our products are openly traded and easily accessible to the Mexican market. I'd say it's just very, very critical that we not lose a, a chance to move grain in that direction if it's, if it's profitable. Neighbor and fellow farmer Bobby Ned Bollock says he's not opposed to an update, but whether or not the U.S. can gain anything for farmers. Well, I don't know exactly how to craft a, a gain for, for agriculture because we do have a, a good relationship with Mexico and they come into this area and have been involved in some country elevator uh, operations and that's been good competition and keeps all the natives honest. Some of that competition comes from a Mexican company called Chapa Quiroga. It owns multiple U.S. elevators, including this one in Progreso, Texas, employs about 300 people, and has invested six to seven million dollars in infrastructure in the last few years. It's now shipping roughly 500,000 metric tons of grain in 2016. And the company we created in Texas won't be worth all of that investment, all of that infrastructure. It would be worthless because we should move to other parts of Mexico for us to be able to receive grain through other means. Mexican customers are not going to say only, oh yes, my grain is going to be 20% higher. They're going to seek opportunities in other places. Including from South America and any major changes could impact farming in South Texas significantly. In fact, I would say three quarters of the production in our draw area, which is essentially Houston South, um, three quarters of that goes across the border to Mexico. Production in South Texas in general of, of row crops would be vastly different without Mexico as a consumer. It would be a pity if 
if things go wrong. But I'm, I'm very uh, convinced, I'm very confident that things are going to go in the right uh, way. And as these stakeholders see it, leading to positive economic growth for everyone. We need a healthy Mexican economy. It's important, it's as important as anything that they can buy our products. All right, when we come back, we'll follow the grain south as end users in Mexico worry about what renegotiations could mean for the future. And later, can Mexico replace U.S. suppliers? We'll hear from some big importers. Welcome back to Ag Day. Once U.S. farmers harvest and sell, much of that product ends up in Mexico. And for the buyers and end users here, NAFTA is an important part of every transaction. Whether it's loaded and driven or rolls out by rail, U.S. grains are pouring out of our country, headed for end users in Mexico. We use raw material, corn, sorghum, wheat, fiber-like cottonseed hulls to make feed for livestock. This family-run feed mill says NAFTA helped make that grain and in turn their feed competitive, and they'd like to buy more. We have a plan to do that for us to grow in 2018, but we're waiting to see what happens with NAFTA before making the investment. A multi-million dollar decision now putting their business and futures on hold. My children, they've already started a different business, completely different to my business, so they won't have to depend on Mexican policies or American policies. About an hour away, tucked into the hillsides near Sabinas Hildago, is the Rancho La Jolla feedlot, where owner Martin Gonzalez also hopes one day to share his business with family. I mean, the biggest part of this was my parents' work, my parents' job. It was discipline, it was their hard work, and there is continuity to that. And that's something that I want to convey to my children and to my grandchildren. Since starting with 180 calves 30 years ago, the operation has grown steadily. Today, it's feeding roughly 3,000 tons of corn a month to 20,000 head of cattle. Mexico has the potential to continue growing, and we're fortunate in that we're right next to the number one grain-producing country. An advantage in a competitive market where feedlot numbers continue to fall. I'm completely married to NAFTA. It's going to help our country. It's going to help both countries. For him, finding feed elsewhere is a problem he'd rather not face. We could look to South America, but it's really not practical. I mean, only if the United States just refused to sell to us, then we might have to resort to that. 500 miles to the south, U.S. grains are satisfying a thirst in Mexico's burgeoning craft beer industry. I think uh, what is happening right now in Mexico is pretty similar uh, for what happened 25 years ago in the U.S. It's a growing market for U.S. barley farmers in places like Montana. And, and we have to say that right now we are 400 Mexican breweries. 80% of us, we import our base malts uh, mainly from the U.S. Free trade between neighbors is helping steep the industry here, but... If something changes in between the NAFTA relationship in between Mexico and the U.S., uh, of course the boom of craft beers in Mexico can be damaged a little bit. One product, two countries, and three Mexican businesses now cautiously waiting to see if their future will include more or less. American grain. All right, up next we'll look at how Mexico sources its grain and how soon it can start looking elsewhere when this special edition of Ag Day continues. Now Mexico is a deficit ag producer for things like corn, so it needs to import raw materials. And while proximity and infrastructure has made the U.S. a logical trading partner, buyers are now looking to the sea. As the feed goes out, the trains roll in to Grupo Gramosa, a commercial elevator and feed mill in Querétaro, Mexico. Where we receive trains full of grain, mostly corn, uh, yellow corn. Uh, we receive about five or six trains a month. Each 110 cars long, weighed down with roughly 60,000 tons of U.S. grain. 
We, we have rail here and we are, have a direct line between the heartland in the, the, the Corn Belt in the, in the U.S., uh, in the Midwest. Nearly 80 million bushels of grain moves through their facilities each year en route to livestock and food companies, driven on the back of NAFTA. I think it was pretty good so far. Actually, if you ask my, my opinion, I don't know what they want to renegotiate. U.S. is feeling that we are getting all the advantage, and I don't think so because now you're able to export something that you, okay. you, you were not able to export on that quantities before NAFTA, no? At the beginning, when we started to hurt, it could be renegotiated. We felt offended because we are partners since this many years before, and now why things need to be changed. But we've been pushed to look for new origins to import grains. This year we've seen more interest from Brazil. Welcome to the Port of Progreso, one of the many Mexican ports seeing fresh investment in recent years. We see the government of Mexico making a continuous investment uh, to expand the scope and size of their ports, which will continue to lower transportation costs. Is it possible to replace the U.S.? It would be a complicated thing to do given the high volume that's imported from the United States. Uh, but we are in contact with the Mexican government. We're in discussions uh, about alternatives for importing, especially corn and uh, soybean. Currently in Veracruz, they're doubling the capacity of their agricultural receiving uh, ability. In doing that work, Grupo Gramosa. Now we have a facility that we are building there, and it will be ready by the end of 2018. And I think, don't get me wrong, and expecting not to be rude, but American farmers uh, maybe are more nervous than us because that volume will be replaced from other origins. Yeah, yeah, sure. Not Absolutely. all, because we will need to keep importing from the United States, but a lot of volume will change the origin. A trend that may already be underway. We realize that we depend on grain from the United States, but we have to start looking at the possibility of importing from South America in case uh, the agreement falls apart. In the end, we hope that common sense will prevail and that our trade relations will go on for a very long time. Mexico continues to invest in its ports, but how much grain is coming from other countries? We'll look at that next. And later, as one of the world's largest beer exporters, Mexico has a lot at stake in these NAFTA negotiations, including the raw material. The most recent round of NAFTA negotiations ended in a flurry of terse words and strong statements. Of course, that has the U.S. ag industry on edge, worried about doing long-term harm to relationships with two of our biggest customers. Now, while in Mexico, grain importers told me they're already looking south for supplies. Engineered several miles from shore in the blue waters of the Gulf sits the Port of Progreso on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. Here we're bringing in about 2.1 million metric tons of grain and oil seeds every year. Less than two days from the Port of New Orleans, Progreso is a major hub and entry point for U.S. grains. It's been one of the most important reasons why the United States has been the closest trading partner with Mexico in recent years. Currently, this facility handles about seven ships a month, and one of its key strategic benefits is this storage. And in fact, they're adding capacity here as we speak. We have around 120,000 metric tons of storage available, um, so it allows for a continuous discharge without any stops. Seems like a very efficient setup. It's actually uh, one of the most efficient ports in all of Latin America and is the most efficient port in Mexico. And Mexico continues to invest here. We see the government of Mexico making a continuous investment uh, to expand the scope and size of their ports, which will continue to lower transportation costs. Work being done here and elsewhere. Currently in Veracruz, they're doubling the capacity of their agricultural receiving uh, ability. Now we have a facility that we are building there and it will be ready by the end of 2018. Importers like Gramosa aren't waiting for port work or NAFTA negotiations to be done before booking ships from other destinations. Right now we've been pushed to import from other origins. Right now we have several suppliers 
not only United States. According to the U.S. Grains Council in September, Mexico took shipment of four vessels from South America, three from Brazil and one from Argentina, including one to Veracruz and one here to Progreso. This year we've seen more interest from Brazil. They've been making significant investments in the port of Barcarena and the port of Itaqui. Uh, and with these facilities, they're also able to competitively reach the east coast of Mexico with yellow corn and soybeans. These northern ports in Brazil are helping farmers get grain to end users more quickly, shaving up to five days off the shipping time compared to southern ports. We had never previously really contemplated uh, using South America as a continuous source. Uh, we've only ever purchased infrequently and it was always a matter of pricing. These gentlemen have been buying grain from the U.S. for some 30 years. We have done it before because we have taken the advantage of a, of a good price. But I insist, our natural market is 40 hours away from us. U.S. farmer customers, now reluctant buyers of South American grain, as trade uncertainty clouds the opportunities of the future. It's, it is a relationship between these buyers and sellers, um, and I think that's important. U.S. grain shows total export bookings to Mexico as of mid-October were up nearly 10 percent. Analysts say the increase may be due to wider than normal basis, but it may also be that Mexican importers are moving grain now ahead of any potential breakdown in talks. When we come back, losing NAFTA could increase the cost of beer, not just in Mexico, but around the world. One of the biggest products traded north to south is U.S. barley. Grain is a major component in Mexican beer. On our travels in Mexico, the U.S. Grains Council stopped at an up-and-coming brewery that worries the world's bar tab could go up if NAFTA is canceled. Mexico is in the midst of a revolution, a beer revolution. Yeah, I think uh, what is happening right now in Mexico is pretty similar uh, for what happened 25 years ago in the U.S. Craft breweries like Primus are popping up across the country. Before this, we were uh, home brewers. Uh, we made a, a home brew for, for us, for our friends, for our family. And eventually people start asking, can you sell me a keg? Can you sell me a couple of bottles? And then we start thinking on starting a business. But for his business and others, it's the duty-free access to U.S. grains that's helping fuel that growth. 80% of the Mexican craft breweries right now, and, and we have to say that right now we are 400 Mexican breweries, 80% of us, we import our base malts uh, mainly from the U.S. Malts in the form of barley are a key ingredient. According to the U.S. Grains Council, the U.S. shipped more than 31 million bushels of U.S. barley to Mexican brewers, worth some $220 million over the last 10 marketing years. Product and quality, this brewer says, they can't source locally. And the big beer makers in Mexico, the owners of brands like Dos Equis and Corona, are using the grain as well. Mexico is the biggest exporter of beer in the world. No, it's, it's not that the Mexican beer is cheaper. No, the Mexican brands are very popular all around the world. Uh, but we are not self-sufficient on barley. We have to source barley from other places in the world. Of course, the U.S. is the cheapest for us because of the transportation. If NAFTA changes disrupt that supply chain, this brewer says costs will go up. If these imports get some duties, uh, Mexico will either have to raise the prices of beer, of beer for all the world or will have to source from other, other, other places from the world. Prior to NAFTA, Mexico set base tariffs for barley and malt at 128% and 175% respectively. The Primus team hopes that doesn't happen. It can be chaotic. Uh, I, I don't think we are really aware of what, of, of what will happen in case NAFTA gets some more taxes on so, some more duties. Instead, this beer-based entrepreneur is choosing to see negotiations as a glass half full, proudly recognizing the end product takes a team effort. I think of the craft beer, either Mexican or American, as a North American product. A North American product built by NAFTA. Beer is my passion. I think because, first of all, beer is really democratic. No? Uh, anyone can have a, a, a cup or a glass of very good beer, uh, either, either if you are a worker on the building industry 
or either if you are a CEO at any uh, transnational, you can really enjoy a beer wherever you are. Democratic indeed. That's all the time we have this morning. Thanks for tuning in and spending some time with this special edition of Ag Day. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day and a happy new year on the farm.